Welcome to Seated Live. I am so excited to dig in God's word together. I'm so excited you guys made some time to be here. And if you're catching us on the recap, no worries. This is the beauty of this Bible study. We get to do it asynchronously and still all take our seat at the table. So I'm excited tonight to do a couple of different things that I have not had the opportunity to do that I really wanted to do. And one of those is to have a little bit of time of worship and prayer here at the top. Then I want to kind of show you guys another Bible study tool that you can use in your private study. And we're going to use it to actually study a little bit privately in small groups. And then we'll come back together and kind of discuss it out. So um, I want to go ahead and start us off with prayer for this evening. And then we're going to listen to a song and just kind of have a moment of worship. So I'm going to come off the screen um, and it'll just kind of be a moment for us to worship. So if you want to turn your screen off and kind of just take a moment um, and just listen to the music, that'll be an awesome time to do that. So let's pray. God, I thank you so much for inviting us to sit and to fellowship with you. God, I, I praise you that you are good and you are mighty and you show up anywhere two or three are gathered in your midst. So God, I pray that you would illuminate your scriptures, God, that you would help us to find something new. We are re reviewing this chapter, God, and though we've read it before, God, I pray that you would show us something new about who you are and about who we are in light of all that you've given us through your son, Jesus. And God, I pray that everything we learn wouldn't serve to make us heady or just puffed up, but God would begin to transform our hearts and help us to love you and love our neighbors better. And God, I pray for every woman represented by this group. I pray that wherever she is, God, those that are in this room, seated around the physical table right now, but God, those who are also elsewhere and tapping in later, God, I pray that you would meet us where we are, that you would open our eyes to see you and sense your spirit at work, that we would walk in step with you, not ahead, and that we wouldn't do things for you, but we would do things with you. God, I pray that we would know you in the power of your resurrection and that we would take our seat in your presence. And it's in Jesus name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. So there's a song that um, has been on my heart for the past two days. And I have no idea why it keeps popping in my head. But um, tonight the Lord was like, I want you to play that song. So I'm going to play this song. Um, it's on the longer end because if you've ever listened to anything that Maverick City Music has anything to do with, it, it is always longer. Um, and so this particular song is Cody Carnes and um, Maverick City Music, and it is called um, Firm Foundation, tagline he won't. Um, and it's just really been blessing me. So I just want us to take a moment to sit with God, to kind of just let that marinate before we dig into his word today. And so, like I said, I'm going to play the song and I'm going to turn my camera off. Um, and unpin my video so you'll kind of see it just disappear into the background for a bit. Um, but I want us to have this opportunity to worship. So let us worship together. God, we thank you just so much for your presence. We thank you that you are a firm foundation we can build our lives on. And that's exactly what you've reminded us as we begin studying the book of Ephesians. You're reminding us that everything we have is built up and fits together in you and your plan through your son. So God, I pray tonight as we open up the scriptures that you would teach us who you are, help us to find who you are in this place, that we can get to know you and enjoy your word and enjoy our time spending time with you, dad. We bless you and praise you in Jesus name. Amen. Okay. So I hope that that kind of just set the tone for tonight. Um, that song has been blessing me for the past couple of days, just helping me to refocus and keep my mind and keep the main thing, the main thing, so to speak. Um, but tonight I wanted to kind of give you guys an opportunity to learn a little bit. So I'm actually going to share my screen because I want to teach you guys how to use a tool that will give you commentaries, Greek original language, um, different kinds of, and I mean, it's, there's just a lot of tools in this one website and it's all free. So I wanted to give you guys an opportunity to learn a little bit how I utilize this in some spaces. So this particular um, resource is called Blue Letter Bible. So this is just one of very a lot of free resources that you have. Um, it has a lot of really good translations on it, but it it gives you so many tools 
that you can kind of go verse by verse, line by line and break this up, right? So what I want to show you guys is what would happen if you decided that you were going to study like we just did. We're studying Ephesians right now, Ephesians 3. You would type it in. You can choose your translation. It gives you all of these options. <laughs> and then um, I'm going to choose just the ESV just to make it easy. And you can hit the search button. And as you can see, it kind of brings out here each verse line by line in the ESV. If you wanted to change it, you can go up here. You can change it to another translation and kind of hit the button. It changes it right quick with CSB. Um, but I want to also show you something else it will do. So if you come over here and you hit this button, Tools, next to any of these verses, it'll actually open up a bunch of different options of things you can do, right? So if you just hit it though, it'll bring those up on a tab. So the first thing it gives you is an interlinear. And what an interlinear does is it actually is gonna take that verse in the original language, Greek in the New Testament, Hebrew in the Old Testament, and it will tell you what that root that word is, what the root word is. That's where you're seeing that G38. And then it gives you um, basically like the parsing, is it feminine, is it singular, genitive? Those are like cases. So it tells you genitive, it means it belongs to someone. Um, that, get, that gets into a little bit advanced kind of testing, or excuse me, um, parsing. But what it also does is it will tell you each phrase. It tells you for this is a phrase, not just a word. It tells you, and you can kind of break down each one. And then if you click on the Strong's number, it'll actually tell you about that particular word. So it'll tell you how you would pronounce it. It'll tell you um, different pronouns you can use. And it, it kind of just breaks down what that particular word, word means. So I'm gonna show you, um, and I'm gonna use the word prisoner as an example. So if I click on prisoner, it'll show me anywhere in the, in the ESV where the word prisoner was translated. So this gives you an immediate cross-reference. And what I like to do is this is where you let the Bible interpret the Bible, okay? So this is where you're saying, okay, where else has the word prisoner been used? Now I can see, okay, Babylon took him prisoner, any crowd prisoner that they wanted. They had a prisoner named Barabbas. Okay, we are literally talking about someone in jail. This is not figurative, figurative in this original language. They are talking about someone in prison. But you can also go back and then say, okay, what is this word? Where else has it been used? And it tells you, okay, this word, and you can hear pronounce. Strong's G, 1198, Desmias. 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 So, you know, Desmias is the word that is being used for prisoner. And this literally refers to someone that's captive and being held in bonds. So you can actually begin to study the text into the Greek language with this one tool. So the other really cool thing about this, if you hit this tool button, you can go to other translations. You can see what this verse is like in the KJV, in um, New King James, NLT, NIV, right there. Then you can also see other cross-references. Hey, are there any other places, like we just said, where the word was used somewhere else in a text? And it literally goes word by word, and you can get as deep as you want to. Um, then it gives you commentary. I love this button because then it'll give you options that you can look into to study Ephesians. You have audio and video um, options. Elizabeth Elliott is a wonderful woman theologian that I love to mix up and make sure that we're getting a good variety of people that are speaking into it. They have it in Spanish. They have Jameson Fawcett Brown was one I use a lot in seminary. So I'm really familiar with it. You've probably heard of Spurgeon before, um, but it just gives you a lot of options that are related to this particular verse. But then it also gives you dictionaries. You can go and look up different dictionaries and what the biblical definition of these words are. And this will also help you if there's other themes that you can find from those words that you're looking at. Vine is a popular one. Um, another one that I know um, is used a lot is Easton's. And then miscellaneous just kind of has other things. So are there some maps that related? Maybe somebody made some word, kind of wordle word clouds of things that come up. This will also give you like, this is Paul's journey to Rome. You can actually take a look and click on these things and it'll show you, okay, this is kind of where he happened. This is the main route he took. We can kind of take a closer look at where he was and where he was going when he went um, and writing Ephesians. I love, love, love the Blue Letter Bible. It just gives you a lot of things right up front that you can use, and but you can also change this. If you don't want to look at it verse by verse, you can also switch this to the paragraph view up here up top and it'll allow you to do this. This is also great 
if you want to be able to like copy things. So to copy it, you go to verse, you can hit copy options and you can say, okay, do you want to copy it in pair? You want the reference and then the verse. And then you can say, select all the verses. Do you want to abbreviate the books? You can literally change it however you want. It'll select all the verses and then it'll give you the option to copy. You just hit copy. And then if you want to copy and paste that somewhere to basically diagram it later, it gives you the option. You also have this option up here to listen to the Bible and it'll give you the translations that they have available if you want to listen. Now, I've told you guys, if you want to do audio Bible, I still think you version is the best option for that because they have a lot of translations available, including ones that Blue Letter doesn't have. But this gives you a ton of ton of free options all in one place. So I just kind of wanted to take a moment and share that with you guys, because I just wanted you guys to have the tools you need. So I know sometimes people are like, I don't know how to study. I don't know how to go as deep. And then I want to also encourage you, if you try to use last that tool, take it one step at a time. Try to maybe just look at one or two verses while you're studying and see what you can just dig around and kind of stumble into. You'll be surprised what you learn just by kind of just wandering around in the text. I call this kind of spelunking the text. Spelunking, spelunking is a term that I learned when I was in high school and we were told to kind of just get on the computer and play around with it and just see if you can figure out some features. Now, this was back such a long time ago that I'm pretty sure I was playing around in like draw on Microsoft Word. OK, so we were supposed to go in and click, just kind of click around and see what we could figure out just playing around. And it was to get us comfortable with the fact that sometimes when you embrace a new technology, you're not going to know all the ins and outs of it right at first but you don't want to lose out and miss out on trying it just because you're nervous about breaking it or doing something wrong. So you just take some time to kind of spelunk a resource. And I want to encourage you to do that anytime you're trying to do something new. So if you're trying to figure out and use cross references for the first time, if you want to look into the Greek for the first time, don't be afraid to make those mistakes. Know the whole point is to get to know God better. And then beyond getting to know God better, the point is to enjoy his word. So if you get to a place where you're like, oh, this is kind of frustrated. I don't know what I'm doing. Just remember, you don't have to know what you're doing right at it. And as with anything else, you get to know him better the more time you spend in his word and you get better at it the more you practice. So I just wanted to kind of give you guys an opportunity to get to know that tool. But now we're going to dig into the text. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do things a little different tonight. That's why we're in Zoom. You guys are actually going to be broken up into groups. Yes, you're going to be broken up into groups. So I'm going to break you guys up and I'm going to break you up into two groups. Each of you is going to be assigned a different section. And so we broke Ephesians 3 into two sections. First, it was Ephesians 3, um, 1 through 12, I'm excuse me, 1 through 14, and then, yeah, 1 through 13. And then the second section was 14 to 21. So I'm going to break you guys into groups. And you're basically going to just discuss what's going on in that group for a little bit. And then we're going to come back and I'm just going to have you guys kind of share out any insights or things that stood out to you. And we're going to discuss those further. And I'll share a couple of more tidbits that the Lord gave me from Ephesians 3 here at the end that kind of wrap it all up. Does that sound good? Okay. So you have been randomly assigned to a breakout room. And in just a moment, it's going to pop up on your screen. And let's see. Do, 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 do. Okay. Yep. Awesome. Go into the rooms. Perfect. And those of you who are catching a recap. I'm going to actually stop it right here and you'll pop back in to the video when we're already wrapped up. So I'll see you in a brief second for you. Okay, I'm starting the recording. All right, guys, I don't know about y'all, but our breakout session was right. Was y'all's breakout session good? Indeed it was. I'm so grateful. I got I, yes. it's size. <laughs> I'm just saying, we had a good time. Okay. So um, the the online crew, those who are catching a recap are just joining back in. So I told them that we were going to jump into private groups. Um, so we have the freedom to talk as we felt led and not think, oh, this is going to be stored on YouTube for, you know, all eternity. Um, but we're going to come back now together and discuss a little bit of what we um, discussed in our group. And we had some good conversations. So the group I was in, we had Ephesians 
chapter three, the first set of verses, verses one through 14. And so I want somebody from my group to go ahead and just share some of the things we ended up talking about coming out of this section. What are we, what was just some of our takeaways that stood out to us? Anybody can speak. I know, um, sorry, the main part that is sticking out to me, I was multitasking over here, driving and such, but um, I think the main takeaway is we were talking about how much we have to depend on God because we can't, we can't do anything without him. And you, you provided a really funny, but realistic visual of like your kid trying to clean up a mess with the already wet napkin and that <laughs> just made me laugh because I feel like that's what I'm doing in life when I'm not um, allowing God to lead and that just looks silly like thinking of like a little kid cleaning up with the already wet napkin so um, I think that was the main takeaway is being led by God and we also talked about how um, Paul was an unlikely leader but he wrote to all these people and led them and um you know brought them hope through God and everything um and he he wasn't afraid to um this is another thing we talked about um to admit and be vulnerable that he wasn't perfect Mm -hmm. and was vulnerable about that which is what um we should all do as well because it's easy to try to cover up and put up a front that we have everything all together when in reality we really don't and we we do need God you know to hold us together because we can't do it all on our own yeah so good Candice you want to add anything no that was great Kiana (laughs) with the recap so we only I know she did that come on quick summary yeah she came through we started off talking about um the main thing that stood out was the fact that Paul was just the least likely person, right? He was just one of the least likely people to be chosen. And then we talked about how it became this amazing contrast of how he, it says in verses, I'm let me find the exact verse. It says in verses, verse 10, that he was the one that was given this mystery, but the point of the mystery being made known now was show it could show through the church to the rulers and authorities of heavens. And I said, it reminded me of the language we get into in Ephesians six, where it says that the demonic, you know, the rulers and the powers, it was like that same kind of language. And it made me think about the fact that we, here we have Satan, which was a messenger of God. Cause angel just means messenger of God who was supposed to carry a message for God, but tried to get prideful and usurp that authority. And then we have Paul who literally was trying to squash all messages about Jesus. Right. And he's the one that's been chosen to reveal like nine of the 12 major mysteries in the new um, in the Bible, nine of them were revealed through Paul, um, eight or nine of them. And so it's like, he's just this unlikely person. And he even admits it. He's like in verse eight, I'm the least of all the saints. He's like, but now God has given it to me. And we start talking about how, you know, God chooses those who are unlikely because then he gets even more glory because they know that this power was given to him. But also when we, um, and Keanu, it was you, you brought up this beautiful thing about suffering, that last verse about the suffering and the afflictions. And you were saying that because some of your family members are suffering, but they've talked about how it's drawing them closer to God. And we said, that, you know, when we suffer, it gives us an opportunity to go through with intimacy and with purpose and that sometimes in the church we make this mistake of skipping through to the purpose like oh we've been comforted so we can comfort others forgetting that Paul only had something to offer the Ephesians he only had a mystery to give them because he had spent time with God and that mystery then enabled him to set other people free but that vulnerability he had made what he was doing so relatable he never presented himself to be God, to be perfect, to be someone to be continually watched. He made it very clear, hey, I am still just a servant like y'all. I still need Jesus just like y'all. I am still on the same level as you. God has revealed this mystery to me and given me the ability to carry it. But at the end of the day, we all fall even at the feet of Jesus. And that was just basically kind of where we sat. And we did talk a lot about the importance of vulnerability, that if we aren't going to be open about where we are in our own struggles um, with each other, we can't, it, it inhibits our growth, but also with God, which is where we got that napkin analogy. I was like, sometimes I'd be hiding my stuff from God. Like, you don't know, I'm sitting over here jealous. I'd be like, oh Lord, you know, 
And, but then I bring it to him and like, why am I hiding this? Like, and I use the analogy of the napkin. So that was what our group talked about. It was so, so good just in those few short minutes. So tell me other group, what did y'all have? Who's going to speak? Give me the recap. What was y'all talking about over there? I know it was good. Okay, I guess that means say, it's me. Give me the recap. <laughs> so we both um, kind of talked about how we were struggling with this with this part before tonight. And um, we both read through it using a commentary and were able to share with each other and and get some enlightenment from the, these particular parts of scripture, which we talked about how important community is and testimony is because that's where you're, where you grow. So this verse of scripture starts with Paul and we, we get insight into his prayer for the family of God and which he's making reference there to both the Jews and the Gentile, which he talked about in chapter two, um, that God would grant us according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man and that christ may dwell in your hearts through faith so um taja had pulled out that you know to dwell in you means to to actually make himself at home in us and when you when you are at home somewhere you feel comfortable with that person or comfortable, they feel comfortable in your space. And that requires, like you mentioned earlier, a level of vulnerability mm -hmm. that sometimes, even though we know God knows everything, literally knows exactly what's going on, we feel a part of us feels unsafe in sharing what is really going on with God in prayer out of perceived reverence to him like oh I don't want to take this thing it's too far to the left to God but he literally desires to know all of that and to do to dwell within our hearts and to know that our innermost secrets and all of that so we had a pretty good discussion around that section of scripture in verse 17 and then um what stood out to me was that you being rooted and grounded in love um, being rooted and grounded in love can be so hard to do, especially when we're constantly affronted or or have offense. But love is it should be our foundation. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, verse 19, 18 says, may we be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, the height to know the love of Christ, which passes all knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. And so it's almost, even though it's not an if then statement, it's it almost reads to me like when you function in that level of love, that's when you get to see all of the depth of love that Christ has for us. And so we we had, you know, some conversation around that as well. So I'm a, I'm gonna yield the mic. Not yield the mic, but I'm gonna yield it over to Taj to see if she has anything she wants to add. But yeah, that was the gist of what we talked about. Yeah, uh, faith uh, pretty much summed it all up. Um, the the commentary just really kind of helped helped us break through that wall because we both were just like uh, we had hit a wall with it. Um, and one of the things that like just to expand on like the first part about like um Christ dwelling in your heart and making himself at home just how like sometimes um you know the it, it gets pounded in it can get pounded in our head so much to like respect God and to rever him and to like put him in such an esteemed place and we should but then it hinders us and so letting him make his home in our hearts because we feel like our hearts aren't worthy of him our lives aren't worthy of him um, and right. so we, we never give him the chance to make us holy because mm -hmm. we feel like we have to be holy first. And right. so if we're struggling in a particular area, then it's like, 
well, I can't bring this to God because this is beneath him. So I got to deal with it on my own. Wow. And then we never deal with it. We just kind of stay stuck in our, our mess. And so that was the part um, that really was just like, wow. Like it just kind of hit me that like, you know, Christ wants to dwell in my heart and he wants to um, clean out my mess. He wants to make, uh, you know, my impure things pure. And so, like, I have to let him make himself at home inside of me. Y'all, I don't know if y'all see it, but we got a common theme here, okay? I don't know if y'all see it, but we have a common theme of this dwelling and vulnerability and this kind of internal thing that God wants to do. And I think that's exactly what we're supposed to walk away from Ephesians 3 with. And so I'm going to actually use this as a springboard because as you guys are speaking, God was like, yep, this is what we're, this is what we harping on. This is what we're taking away tonight. And so um, just as promised, I want to close up our teaching with a few things that God had been kind of just revealing to me. And this is something I think he wants to give to us um, prophetically tonight. And so if that word freaks you out, just know that prophetically really just means to encourage in due season, like the Lord is speaking right now. And he has some encouragement for us right now that he wants us to be able to grab hold of, to walk forward. And so the word of tonight is vulnerability. I love that you guys went into that group and y'all were struggling. didn't quite know how to approach it, but you guys tackled it together. And it reminds me of that scripture where it says, you know, if one person goes alone, you know, and they stumble, who is there to lift them up? But when two go together, you know, they can kind of walk a little bit further. And the Bible also tells us that, you know, one can put, you know, a hundred, you know, a thousand to flight, but two, you know, can put 10,000 to flight. It doesn't just increase from 1,000 to 2,000. It multiplies the reach that we have when we go together. And I think one of the ways we go together is when we are willing to be vulnerable. Cause I know it took a lot to go in there and be like, Okay, you tell me what you got. Okay, you tell me what you got, you know, and not be like, okay, I honestly don't know. I do not know the answer. And by doing that together, you bravely go forward and find the answer of what God is doing. And so what we're going to speak about a little bit today is about vulnerability. And so where the verse that I think there's two verses and both of you guys kind of have highlighted it a little bit um, that I think God wants us to zero in to walk away with as we get ready to study Ephesians for next week, because um, we only we are halfway through the book of Ephesians. I know we've been slow walking this thing, but I hope you guys feel like you've gone deeper with God instead of necessarily just finishing the book. But I believe this is what God wants us to walk away with, the importance of vulnerability in the life of a believer. Um, I'm a firm believer that what we believe about God and what we believe about our job as people of God impacts how we live our everyday life. I've been studying the Old Testament and I've been in Deuteronomy and I'm listening over and over again because he gives the Ten Commandments a little bit in Exodus. He gives commands again in Numbers. He gives them again in Leviticus. And here we are in Deuteronomy and I've heard these commands or some iteration of these commands over and over and over again by this point. And one of the things I realized, I was like, God, I just don't even know that this is possible. I don't even know why you ever gave this to them. They're, they're never going to be able to meet this. And he's like, yeah, no. I absolutely knew that they were never going to be able to do this. I knew they were going to, need to be totally reliant upon me. But the point of it was, is that they weren't supposed to just be any old group of people. This was a people that were supposed to be marked by being my people. And my people walk and move and do life differently. And so when we look at God's word, and even though we don't have the prescriptive example that he gave them in the Old Testament, we do have a life change that is supposed to occur on the inside of us. And the only way to get to it is through vulnerability. And so I want us to look back at Ephesians and let's go to um, chap chapter three, verse. Now, where did it go? I just had it. Oh, verses uh, 11 and 12. Okay. And I'm going to read these particular verses. And so it says this, according to his eternal purpose, accomplished in Christ Jesus, in him, we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. So then I asked you not to be discouraged over my afflictions because they are for your glory. He's saying we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. 
Now, my commentary in my Bible says this. It says, in Christ Jesus, our Lord, believers have boldness. And this Greek word is parhesian. And it means freedom to speak without reserve, but openly and frankly with fearless confidence. I'm going to read that definition again. It says, freedom to speak without reserve, but openly and frankly with fearless confidence. Okay. So think about that boldness. Does that not type of boldness, normally, I don't know about you, but sometimes people associate boldness with like brashness in your face, kind of knocking things down. But this is actually saying it means to speak freely and openly without reserve. That's boldness. I don't know about you, but does that not just sound like what we were just talking about, the importance of vulnerability, of being vulnerable in community, vertically, and being vulnerable with God horizontally? It is through that boldness that we begin to walk into all of the things that Paul prays at the end of Ephesians. He begins to pray that we can be rooted, that we know the riches, the immeasurable riches is said twice in this chapter. We see it in verse eight and we see it again in verse 16. He says the riches of his glory, the incalculable riches, that God has so much good he wants to give us. And he wants to bring all of that goodness to dwell inside of us. But the only way to get there is if we come boldly and confidently. And it says that we have this access to God because at one point sin had separated us, but the sacrifice of God now brings all of those riches, all of that access right to our front door. And it is with that, that God wants to actually dwell among us. And I love it. Vulnerability is something that God requires for the believer. I don't know if I've ever realized that until this moment that me being vulnerable should be the mark of someone who walks with God. Now, this is not saying let's put all our business on front street. Let's let everybody know because we already know that the enemy loves to take advantage of what's going on. The enemy loves to kind of jump in and take little bits of our lives and drag it through the mud. Although I recently heard someone say that the reason we go through spiritual warfare is not so much that Satan wants to attack our marriages or that he wants to attack our kids or that he wants to take our lives from us in that way is that he wants to distract us in our allegiance from God. And he knows that some of the easiest and most vulnerable ways to access that is by attacking our families and by attacking our lives in this way. But we see here that Paul is like, look, you can come boldly in him, we have bold and confident access through faith. And I'm given this visual because it says that we have this access because the sin has been covered and removed by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So now I see two images and I want you guys to see it with me. There are two options that we have here. In the Old Testament, prior to the covering of Christ, the way that they got access to God. Now, remember, in the Old Testament, people love to say, oh, they had to go through all these things and sacrifices to get to God. Let us remember that a holy God who's sitting on his throne before his son came to cover all the sacrifice made his way to live in the middle of a sinful group of people who he already knew were going to reject him. He knew what the Israelite community was going to do. He still chose them, loved them, blessed them, and still made a way to live among them. When we look at the Old Testament temple, we know that all of the godly head, the father, the son, and the spirit were represented in and among that people. I can actually give you guys some examples um, and show you a visual where literally the encampment of the people, the tabernacle or the tent was in the, the tent of meeting was in the middle and they encamped on all three sides. If you look at it from the top, y'all, I kind of got to draw this out for y'all, okay? Because it, it's just so cool. It's so dope. So you would literally have, um, let me see if my camera will let me see it, let you see it. Uh, let's see if it'll have, okay, you see this? So the tabernacle would be here and there would be an encampment of people here and a tamping of people here and a tamping of people here and a camping of people here. Do y'all see what that looks like? Can y'all see what that looks like from an aerial view, from a God's eye view, what that looks like if God himself- is in, Thank you. It's a cross all day long. That's a cross, y'all. So their formation, the way God told them the lineup was with him at the center and them in battle formation, they lived and moved in these formations, right? I just think that's so dope because what we're talking about in Ephesians is Paul says, this was always the plan in verse 11. He says, according to his eternal purpose accomplished in Christ Jesus, this ain't something new he came up with. This was the plan from the very beginning. 
that we would be able to find our savior and meet with God through Jesus Christ. It was the plan from the beginning. And so in the middle, God sits with them, but because he was holy, there were three ways that people existed. You were either unclean, clean, or holy. Unclean is where most of us fall because we had sinned or something had happened and there was a bunch of ways you could be unclean. Clean was if you had gone through the ceremonial practices of sacrificing so you could become clean. And holy meant you were set apart. It meant you were set apart from use. So God literally goes through this threefold process with us. He takes us from unclean, washes us in the blood of the lamb to make us clean. And then he doesn't just want us to just be cleaned up by Jesus. He wants us to be holy and set apart. And this is where the sanctification work comes as we walk closer to God. But I want to draw this contrast to y'all. When he made that temple, it had three layers. So there was an outer court. And this is where you would come in. You would go in through one gate. It had curtains all the way around. You could literally only come in through one gate. And that's to represent that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the light. You could only come one way, but through him. You come in through that one gate, you would go inside, and that's where they would give their sacrifices. If somebody had sinned, if somebody had touched a dead body, if a woman had her cycle, all the things that prescribed a sacrifice, it would happen right there. And then there was the inner court. In the inner court was where the priests were allowed to go and they had to keep incense burning. Incense represented the prayers in the New Testament. That's what that represents. So you have this inner court. So you have an outer one. So if you have a piece of paper, draw yourself a box. So it's a box and then you go in one box and that's the inner court. And that's where we have incense and prayers kind of going forward for the people. And then you had an even smaller box called the Holies of Holies. This is where the Ark of the Covenant was. So the tabernacle, um, the temple, the Ten Commandments were kept there. This is where the, the manifest presence of God would be. And the high priest was the only one that could go in. One person out of the millions of people represented by the, the children of Israel, one person was allowed in and he was only allowed in one time a year on behalf of all the people on the Day of Atonement. One high priest could go in and literally be in the manifest presence of God, the tangible presence of God. That was the only access that we had. But now we come to a new Testament and a new covenant. And we come to what Paul says, where he says that Christ wants to dwell in our hearts through faith in verse 17. He says, I pray that you can be rooted and established in this love so you can comprehend what is the length and the width and the height and the depth of his love. Guys, he's talking about a tabernacle, length, width, height, depth. These are, these is volume. He's talking about the new tabernacle that he's taking place in our hearts. And I want you to get that Jesus took his tabernacle in, in, in physical form and put it inside of us to be the living tabernacles of God. And what do we have? Do y'all know that we have a threefold court too? We have our body, our soul, and then our spirit. And it is our spirit that connects with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is in tune in that holies of holies that then manifests in what we do in our soul. Our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And then what we believe with our mind, what we decide to do with our will, and what we feel and respond to with our emotions determines what we do with our bodies. Can y'all see that? I drew it out for y'all. These my notes, okay. So you got your holy temple, you got your outer court, your inner court, and your holies of holies. But for us, we have our soul, our body, our soul, and then our spirit. Can y'all see that correlation? And the reason that God could move away from meeting with us only in one physical space and meeting with us one time with a high priest is because Hebrews tells us that we have a high priest who sympathizes with our weakness, who understands everything we've gone through. And he went through and he didn't just go and meet with God on our behalf. He satisfied the requirements of every single area. He gave his body as the sacrifice. He laid his blood on the altar there and in the innermost courts. And that he, in the innermost place, he spent his time in the garden of Gethsemane, praying and interceding, not just for himself, but for us. And it says in multiple times in John, we can see that he prayed and interceded for us. And we know that by the Bible, it says that he sits on the right hand of the father, still interceding for us. Our high priest satisfied every single requirement at every single level so that we could have this bold access to come to God and say, I am jealous and I'm struggling. God, I am nervous because I'm not sure what's happening in my marriage. God, I am afraid 
because I don't like what I'm seeing manifested in my children. And I don't think that I have the capacity to help them. God, I'm looking at my bank account. In my bank account, the numbers and dollars and cents ain't making sense. And God, I don't see how you are being Jehovah Jireh in this because I don't know how I'm going to pay these bills. Or God, I don't know how I'm going to step out. God, I am scared to step into this next thing. God is so good and so near to us because Jesus came and walked with us. And here's the, here's the beautiful part, y'all. That our vulnerability doesn't give us greater access to God. Jesus already gave us the access. Our vulnerability enables us to grab his hand and walk back into the innermost courts where we're supposed to be. Y'all remember we read back in Ephesians 2 that we are seated at the right hand of the Father. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. That we actually get to maintain our residence as citizens of heaven. But we walk it out on earth to the level at which we are going to be vulnerable about where our struggles are in our body, in our soul, so our spear can invade those spaces. Can y'all see that image? Let me know in the chat. Let me know if that's making sense. Let me know if I've lost you. But I just, can y'all see that, that, that beautiful work that has been done at the cross? That the Holy Spirit sits and dwells in us. And he is influencing our mind and our will and our emotions so we can walk this thing out in our actions in our body. And the access point is the confidence in who says we have that boldness and that confident access to him. Because what had once been separated, this is literally the implication in the Greek, what had once been separated, what we once didn't have access to, we now have access to by way of Jesus Christ. And so now we can allow him into the deepest recesses of our hearts to settle, inhabit, take up residence and make his home, his new home, not in a temple, not in a tent, but in our lives. And this is what church looks like. That a bunch of houses for God, that each room links up together and encourages each other as we go. This is why we fellowship in community. This is why we grow better together. This is why we learn better when we accept our vertical relationship with God and then use that to experience him horizontally as well. This is the good news, y'all. So as we get ready to know, this is the good theology. And this is super important. We are ready to close. All of this theology we got, if we're going to recap, you know, we had in verse one that we got this salvation in Christ. We've been free. We've been set free. This was always the plan. We've been built together with Christ. That was the summary of basically chapter one. We have been sealed with the Holy Spirit and nothing can break that up. And then we get into chapter two and it says, you were once dead in your trespasses, but in God, we get this immeasurable riches again. We get this immeasurable riches in Christ. This is a gift that he gives us. It's not of our works. We cannot boast about it, but we can receive this free gift. And as we receive this free gift, he has work he wants us to do from our seated position. We are no longer foreigners. We are brought close in Christ. And then he says, and this was a mystery, how he would want to not just bring the Gentiles together, but bring everything together under Christ, that we have been given God's grace to understand these immeasurable riches, and he wants to dwell within us. So it is my prayer that you understand how deep his love is for you, the depth, the width, the height that he has for you, that you would be filled with the fullness of God. Not just a little bit. Paul ends up this, this last part. He says that you know Christ's love and that you can be filled in verse 19 with the fullness of God in every inch of who you are that you would experience who he is. And this is where we get ready to go into chapter four because y'all the next word, and I want y'all to remember this when we start reading next week, the very first word we get in Ephesians chapter four, verse one says, therefore, I urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received with all humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with another in love, making every effort to keep unity in the spirit through the bond of peace. Therefore, we can't study what it looks like to walk like God if we don't understand all that God has given us. So sisters, I want to encourage you as I appreciate you coming and being vulnerable in this space. Keep showing up. Show up where you can show up and spend that time with God because he is asking for more access. And the beautiful, beautiful image God has been reminding me of. He's like, look, I didn't, there was a, there's a section in Deuteronomy. And I think I shared it in a group where it says that he never came and he didn't say, Hey, we're going to blow out all the enemies. He said, I'm going to give you land bit by bit. 
little by little. I'm going to knock out this king and give him over to your hand. But I'm not, he actually says, I'm not going to drive them all out at once because otherwise the land will be left inhabited. It'll be overgrown and you won't be able to have it in the thriving condition. I want to give it to you. He says, I'm going to walk you through little by little. If God is nudging at your heart for something small, surrender it because he's just trying to walk you into the promised land of his goodness and the fullness of who he is bit by bit. He is trying to walk you into more of who he is bit by bit. He's trying to usher you into looking more like him, to being set apart, to being holy bit by bit. Because this is the work of a holy priesthood, Peter says, of a set apart generation. That is the work that God has called us to. And vulnerability, being open and honest with God and the community of believers he set us in, helps us to grow into that promised land that we're trying to all get into. Not the promised land of heaven, but the access of more Jesus here on earth. Can I get an amen for the vulnerability? Three snaps and a clap amen. for the vulnerability. Amen. Sisters, I thank y'all so, so much for coming out to do Seated Live. I'm so excited. Um, I know those of you guys who missed it, y'all got to make sure y'all are in the room next time. I don't know about y'all, but this just being in Zoom was a great experience to discuss and digest God's word together. And so I just want to pray us out before we go. Um, and anybody, all hearts and minds clear, anybody have anything else that stood out as I was talking that you like, this was so good. I would love to, I would love if y'all would share if there's anything that God gave y'all, you like, yes, I, that made me think of this. Go ahead. I want to share it if y'all want to share it now. Well, I just want to say thank you for this space. And I really, really enjoyed the time that I had to talk with Taja over the scriptures. That was really beneficial to me. So thank you. Absolutely. It was beneficial to me too. Anybody else? Anything else? Okay, let's pray. God, I thank you so much for each woman represented here and each woman that's going to watch the recap. God, I pray that you would help us to be honest with you. Help us to stop hiding, God. You already live inside of us. You've already moved into this fixer-upper, God. And here we are in here trying to sweep dust under rugs and clean up with messy mops. God, you are trying to take over. You want us to just surrender and allow you to clean us up from the inside out. It's your power at work. It's your riches that is in our life. God, would you take up residence in those places that we've hidden? Would you bring our attention to places that we have not yet surrendered to places that we've hidden? God, would you help us to find good, honest spaces, utilizing this one too, to share where we are broken and where we are struggling, that we can uplift another one in prayer and remind each other the truth of who you are. God, we don't get to encouraging others without understanding who you are. So would you help us to sit and take our seats, to remember to prioritize spending time in your word and to just enjoy it, to enjoy this time fellowshipping and enjoying who you are through your word, that it's not something that we have to do or burden us thing, but it's an invitation to get to know you. God, will we accept our invitations and accept our seat? And I pray for every woman you've called to this table, even those who have yet to answer the call, would you draw them near? Would you help the sisters of those of us who are already here to invite someone else into the room that we can continue to grow in the knowledge of who you are? And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, sisters, thank you guys for joining me and I will catch you guys next time.